Dr. Horowitz is a board certified internist and director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center. Um, he's the founding uh, he's a founding member of ILETS and is uh, the president of the Intentional Lyme and Associated Disease Educational Foundation, an organization dedicated to the education of health professionals in diagnosis and treatment of tick-borne disorders. Dr. Horowitz was treated has treated over uh, 11,000 chronic Lyme um, patients in the past 20 years, and he has researched and published on his role of co-infection in patients with persistent symptoms. He was awarded with the Humanitarian of the Year, awarded by the Turn the Corner Foundation in 2007, and for his ongoing work with chronic Lyme disease. It's up to you. Thank you, Armin. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, J'aimerais dire un grand bonjour à ceux qui parlent français. J'avais fait mes études de médecine en français à Bruxelles et euh, j'étais en France euh, pendant cette période de l'été euh, en, en parlant avec euh, les médecins qui font euh, les maladies infectieuses. Alors c'était la première fois que j'étais en France en faisant ces, euh, ces discussions. Donc euh, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous. For those who don't understand French, I basically said, go Canucks, go Canada. <laughs> Um, I don't have any specific conflicts of interest um, with this talk specifically, but I will tell you that I do receive financial support from Zymogen. I'm on their board of advisors, and I've been a consultant for Beijing Medconsin, which is the 10th largest pharmaceutical company in China. Uh, they facilitated my going to China this summer, and I spent time with the Chinese government and the Chinese CDC. I was there for one week discussing Babesia and discussing parasites, and that's part of the reason I'm here with you today because after being with Arm in the summer in Germany and after going to France, um, I spoke at UNESCO at the United Nations in Paris and then at the Infectious Disease National Conference in France, I realized that Babesia and parasitemia is becoming a real problem worldwide. So it was probably very useful for me to go over um, all of the different methods, the way we diagnose Babesia, because it seems like many people are confused as far as how you actually diagnose and treat it. So, as far as chronic Lyme disease, I think most of you know that there are two standards of care. I think you're well aware of that at this point. There are the IDSA guidelines and there are the ILADS guidelines. And many doctors in the U.S. do not follow the IDSA guidelines we may treat for longer periods of time. And this was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine this past year. When they analyzed the infectious disease guidelines, they found that more than half of the recommendations are based on level three evidence. So we really need to pay attention and remain cautious when using those specific guidelines. However, when you're looking at chronic babesiosis and the term that I've coined, MSIDS, or Multiple Chronic Infectious Disease Syndrome, and I've coined this term basically because after seeing now more than 12,000 chronic Lyme patients in over 20 years, almost all of these patients are chronically infected with not just parasites, but many viruses, as Christine said, and I'll show you the overlap that we see in our practice. Um, these patients with MSIDS basically present with chronic tick-borne infections. They have Babesia, they have Borrelia, they may have other pyroplasms which don't test positive on the standard testing. They have Ehrlichia or Anaplasma, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, Rickettsial infections, as well as immune dysfunction and inflammation. They have very high levels of tumor necrosis factor, alpha, IL-1, IL-6, um, as well as heavy metals, chemical exposures where they have problems detoxifying. There's hormonal dysregulations with a lot of adrenal problems in these patients, autonomic nervous system dysfunction with POTS syndrome, sleep disorders, mitochondrial dysfunction, and nutritional deficiencies. So the problem is, is that if you have a patient who comes in with all of these different problems simultaneously, it's like having 10 nails in their foot. If you only pull out one of the nails, the patient will come back to you and say, I still have pain. You need to address all of these symptoms, and I believe that is the reason we're fighting between organizations, that it's not just Lyme disease. You will not find these patients in the literature who have this overview the way I'm describing it to you today. So chronic Lyme disease, in my opinion, is a chronic complex of these multiple co-infections. Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Bartonella, we now find them widespread in ticks. 
These multiple co-infections may suppress the immune system or cause a nonspecific stimulation of the immune system, which leads to inflammation. And it's ultimately these cytokines with inflammation which is causing the symptoms in most of your patients. We've been able to detoxify and open up the detox pathways using things like glutathione, and we find that many of these patients get better without antibiotics simply by pulling out cytokines and working some of the detox pathways. Many co-infections persist despite seemingly adequate courses of co We've been able to detox and open up the detox pathways using things like glutathione, and we find that many of these patients get better without antibiotics simply by pulling out cytokines and working some of the detox pathways. Many co-infections persist despite seemingly adequate courses of co-infections. You heard about Dr. Breischweit, but the problem now is, is that even Bartonella is being transmitted to the fetus. So now we have a problem with not just Lyme and Babesia, but also Bartonella. So MSIDS, or Multiple Chronic Infectious Disease Syndrome, would better define these patients who come to us in our practice who have chronic Borrelia and co-infections, and they have this symptom complex of chronic fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, neuropathy, neuropsychiatric abnormalities. There are multiple overlapping etiologies, and the take-home message for you as clinicians and for patients is please look at all of these factors because the patients will not get well until you look at all of these overlapping etiologies. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on them, but here are these 15 differential points that we always use in our practice. You'll see under infections, under A is bacterial, B is parasites, and that's the one I'm going to describe to you today with Babesia and other pyroplasms, but there are other parasites like filariasis. When I spoke to the head of the Chinese CDC, they had told me that they eliminated filariasis in China. And I then let him know that we're finding filaria, uh, filariasis now in the ticks in the United States. So this is becoming a problem because the tests are very unreliable and many parasitic infections may be getting in, also explaining why these patients are remaining ill. We have a lot of viruses, as Dr. Green had talked about. There's candida. And again, if you go down the list of immune dysfunction, inflammation, toxicity, allergies, nutritional and enzyme deficiencies, mitochondrial dysfunction, psychological issues, many endocrine abnormalities, these patients can't get to sleep, which increases IL-6 and keeps the inflammation going, a lot of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, sometimes GI problems, hepatic problems, there may be drug use with narcotics, and finally deconditioning. These 15 points are essential to keep in mind the patients will not get better. But this talk is only on one small part of it, which is just looking at parasites like Babesia. And again, I thought it was important because there's so much misconceptions about this parasite. How widespread are polymicrobial infections in ticks? Well, it's quite widespread. If you look at New York State and Tokars in September 2009, they did a study in my area in Hyde Park where they took ticks from New York State they used a mass tag multiplex PCR, and in our area, 71% had one organism, 30% had two, and 5% had three. And when you look at the organisms that showed up, you'll notice it's not just Borrelia burgdorferi, but also Borrelia miyamotoi, which is related to relapsing fever in Japan. You may not get necessarily a positive ELISA or a Western blot in a patient that has this form of Borrelia, but it may present as a Lyme-like illness. So just remember that there are different strains of Borrelia that you may not be able to test for, just as there are strains of Babesia that I'm going to show you that also may not test easily. So we're finding a lot of these co-infections. We found them in clinical infectious diseases in the Midwest, Babesia ehrlichia. They're finding ehrlichia and WA1 Babesia in Europe, a lot of tick-borne encephalitis. Uh, they're finding Bartonella in the Midwest. Um, as was talked about, we're now finding Bartonella in ticks in New Jersey. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, mycoplasmin ticks. Dr. Shapi from the University of New Haven did a study, which I was helping her on, where we're now finding multiple mycoplasma species in ticks, including mycoplasma genitalium, mycoplasma pneumonia, and mycoplasma fermentans, the organism that causes Gulf War. So you can get one tick bite. And there's a cesspool of organisms that can all be transmitted at the same time. And a lot of times, you will not find it on testing because they're intracellular. You may need to do multiple PCRs. Now, keeping in mind, there are also emerging new tick-borne species. Regarding Ehrlichia, this was just picked up in the New England Journal of Medicine this year, that patients were presenting with typical Ehrlichia, but it was not Ehrlichia chifensis or Ehrlichia wingi. It was the first report of a new Ehrlichia species. So the take-home message is, new species of tick-borne co-infections may arise and may be present in new areas of the United States or worldwide. And this is exactly the same problem with Babesia. 
At the International Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases last year, the first zoonotic case of Babesia was documented in Tennessee. This was an immunosuppressed patient with fever, fatigue, and headaches. He had not traveled outside Tennessee where Babesia is not supposed to be. They saw parasites on the blood smear, and when they did molecular analysis, it was a novel species. It was not Babesia microti or WA1 or Duncani. It was a different form of Babesia. The take-home message, patients can have babesiosis without testing positive to previously known species. So if you get a patient with malarial type symptoms of these day sweats, night sweats, and chills that we're talking about with cough and air hunger, and all of their Lyme symptoms are much worse, you need to clinically suspect some form of a pyroplasmosis or babesia.